The next morning after breakfast, I told Grover about my dream. We sat in the meadow watching the satyrs chase the wood nymphs through the snow. The nymphs had promised to kiss the satyrs if they got caught, but they hardly ever did. Usually the nymph would let the satyr get up a full head of steam, then she'd turn in a snow-covered tree and the poor satyr would slam into it head first and get a pile of snow dumped on him. When I told Grover my nightmare, he started twirling his finger in his shaggy leg fur. A cave ceiling collapsed on her? She, he asked. Yeah, what the heck does that mean? Grover shook his head. I don't know, but after what Zoe dreamed... Whoa, whoa, what do you mean? Zoe had a dream like that? I don't know exactly. About three in the morning, she came to the big house and demanded to talk to Chiron. She looked really panicked. Wait, how do you know this? Grover blushed. I was sort of camped outside the Artemis cabin. What for? Just to be, you know, near them. You're a stalker with hooves. I am not. Anyway, I followed her to the big house and hid in a bush and watched the whole thing. She got real upset when Argus wouldn't let her in. It was kind of a dangerous scene. I tried to imagine that. Argus was the head of security for camp. A big blonde dude with eyes all over his body. He rarely showed himself unless something serious was going on. I wouldn't want to place bets on a fight between him and Zoe Nightshade. What'd she say? I asked. Grover grimaced. Well, she starts talking really old-fashioned when she gets upset, so it was kind of hard to understand. But something about Artemis being in trouble and needing the hunters, and then she called Argus a brain-boiled blout. I guess that's a bad thing. And then he called her, whoa, 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 wait, how could Artemis be in trouble? I... Well, finally, Chiron came out in his pajamas and his horse tail and curlers, and he wears curlers in his tail? Grover covered his mouth. Sorry, go on. Well, Zoe said she needed permission to leave camp immediately. Chiron refused. He reminded Zoe that the hunters are supposed to stay here until they received orders from Artemis. And she said... Grover gulped. She said, how are we to get orders from Artemis if Artemis is lost? What do you mean, lost? Like she needs directions? No, I think she meant gone, taken, kidnapped. Kidnapped? I tried to get my mind around that idea. How would you kidnap an immortal goddess? Is that even possible? Well, yeah. I mean, it happened to Persephone. But she was like the goddess of flowers. Grover looked offended. Springtime! Whatever. Artemis is a lot more powerful than that. Who could kidnap her? And why? Grover shook his head miserably. I don't know. Kronos? He can't be that powerful already. Can he? The last time we had seen Kronos, he had been in tiny pieces. Well, we hadn't actually seen him. Thousands of years ago, after the big Titan God War, the gods had sliced him to bits with his own scythe and scattered his remains in Tartarus, which is like the gods that bought on this recycling bin for their enemies. Two summers ago, Kronos had tricked us to the very edge of the pit and almost pulled us in. Then, last summer, on board Luke's demon cruise ship, we had seen a golden coffin where Luke claimed he was summoning the Titan Lord out of the abyss bit by bit, every time someone new joined their cause. Kronos could influence people with dreams and trick them, but I didn't see how he could physically overcome Artemis if he was still like a pile of evil bark mulch. I don't know, Grover said. I think somebody would know if Kronos had reformed. The gods would be more nervous. But still, it's weird. You having a nightmare the same night as Zoe? It's almost like they're connected, I said. Over the frozen meadow, a satyr skidded on his hooves as he chased around a red-headed tree nymph. She giggled and held out her arms as he ran toward her. Pop! She turned into a scotch pine and he kissed the trunk at top speed. Ah, love, Grover said dreamily. I thought about Zoe's nightmare, which she had only a few hours after mine. I've got to talk to Zoe, I said. Uh, before you do... Grover took something out of his coat pocket. It was a three-fold display like a travel brochure. You remember what you said about how it was weird the hunters just happened to show up at Westover Hall? I think they might have been scouting us. Scouting us? What do you mean? He gave me the brochure. It was about the hunters of Artemis. The front read, A wise choice for the future. Inside were pictures of young maidens doing hunter stuff, chasing monsters, shooting bows. They were captions like, Health benefits, immortality, and what it means for you. And, A boy free tomorrow. 
I found that in Annabeth's backpack, Grover said. I stared at him. I don't understand. Well, it seems to me... Maybe Annabeth was thinking about joining. I'd like to say I took the news rather well. The truth was, I wanted to strangle the Hunters of Artemis one eternal maiden at a time. The rest of the day I tried to keep busy, but I was worried sick about Annabeth. I went to javelin throwing class, but the Ares camper in charge chewed me out after I got distracted and threw the javelin at the target before he got out of the way. I apologized for the hole in his pants, but he still sent me packing. I visited the Pegasus stables, but Selena Beauregard from the Aphrodite cabin was having an argument with one of the hunters, and I decided I better not get involved. After that, I went in on the empty chariot stands and sulked. Down at the archery fields, Chiron was conducting target practice. I knew he'd be the best person to talk to. Maybe he could give me some advice, but something held me back. I had a feeling Chiron was trying to protect me, like he always did. He might not tell me everything he knew. I looked in the other direction. At the top of Half-Blood Hill, Mr. D and Argus were feeding the baby dragon that guarded the Golden Fleece. Then it occurred to me, no one would be in the big house. There was someone else, something else, I could ask for guidance. My blood was humming in my ears as I ran into the house and took the stairs. I'd only done this once before, and I still had nightmares about it. I opened the trap door and stepped into the attic. The room was dark and dusty and cluttered with junk, just like I remembered. There were shields with monster bites out of them, and swords bent in the shapes of daemon heads, and a bunch of taxidermy, like a stuffed harpy and a bright orange python. Over by the window, sitting on a three-legged stool, was the shriveled-up mummy of an old lady in a tie-dye hippie dress, the Oracle. I made myself walk toward her. I waited for green mist to billow from the mummy's mouth, like it had before, but nothing happened. Hi, I said. Uh, what's up? I winced at how stupid that sounded. Not much could be up when you're dead and stuck in the attic, but I knew the spirit of the Oracle was in there somewhere. I could feel the cold presence in the room like a coiled sleeping snake. I have a question, I said a little louder. I need to know about Annabeth. How can I save her? No answer. The sun slanted through the dirty attic window, lighting the dust motes dancing in the air. I waited longer. Then I got angry. I was being stonewalled by a corpse. All right, fine, I said. I'll figure it out myself. I turned and bumped into a big table full of souvenirs. It seemed more cluttered than the last time I was here. Heroes stored all kinds of stuff in the attic. Quest trophies they no longer wanted to keep in their cabins or stuff that held painful memories. I knew Luke had stored a dragon claw somewhere up here, the one that scarred his face. There was a broken sword hilt labeled, this broke and Leroy got killed, 1999. Then I noticed a pink silk scarf with a label attached to it. I picked up the tag and tried to read it. Scarf of the Goddess Aphrodite, recovered at Waterland, Denver, Colorado, by Annabeth Chase and Percy Jackson. I stared at the scarf. I had totally forgotten about it. Two years ago, Annabeth had ripped the scarf out of my hands and said something like, Oh no, no love magic for you. I just assumed she'd thrown it away. And yet, here it was. She kept it all this time, and why had she stashed it in the attic? I turned to the mummy. She hadn't moved, but the shadows across her face made it look like she was smiling gruesomely. I dropped the scarf and tried not to run toward the exit. That night after dinner, I was seriously ready to beat the hunters that capture the flag. It was going to be a small game, only 13 hunters, including Bianca D'Angelo, and about the same number of campers. Zoe Nightshade looked pretty upset. She kept glancing resentfully at Chiron, like she couldn't believe he was making her do this. The other hunters didn't look too happy either. Unlike last night, they weren't laughing or joking around. They just huddled together in the dining pavilion, whispering nervously to each other as they strapped on their armor. Some of them even looked like they were been crying. I guess Zoe had told them about her nightmare. On our team, we had Beckendorf and two other Hephaestus guys, a few from the Ares cabin, though it still seemed strange that Clarice wasn't around the Stoll brothers and Nico from Hermes' cabin, and a few Aphrodite kids. It was weird that the Aphrodite cabin wanted to play. Usually they sat on the sidelines, chatted, and checked the reflection in the river and stuff, but when they heard we were fighting the hunters, they were raring to go. How to show them love is worthless, Selena Beauregard grumbled as she stepped sharp on her armor. I'll pulverize them. That left Talia and me. I'll take the offense, Talia volunteered. You take defense. 
Uh, oh. I hesitated, because I had, I had about to say the exact same thing, only reversed. Don't you think with your shield and all, you'd be better defense? Tanya already had Aegis on her arm, and even her own teammates were giving her a wide berth, trying not to cower before the bronze head of Medusa. Well, I was thinking it'd be a much be make better offense, Thalia said. Besides, you've had more practice at defense. I wasn't sure if she was teasing me. I had some pretty bad experiences on, with defense on Capture the Flag. My first year, Annabeth had put me out as some kind of bait, and I'd almost been gored to death with spears and killed by a hellhound. Yeah, no problem, I lied. Cool! Talia turned to help some of the Aphrodite kids, who were having trouble suiting up their armor without breaking their nails. Nico D'Angelo ran up to me with a big grin on his face. Barsi, this is awesome! His blue feather bronze helmet was falling into his eyes, and his breastplate was about six sizes too big. I wondered if there was any way I'd look that ridiculous when I first arrived. Unfortunately, I probably had. Nico lifted his sword with effort. Do we get to kill the other team? Well, no. But the hunters are immortal, right? That's only if they don't fall in battle. Besides, it'd be awesome if we just resurrected as soon as we were killed so we could keep on fighting. And Nico, this is serious. Real swords, these can hurt. He stared at me, a little disappointed, and I realized I just sounded like my mother. Whoa, not a good sign. I patted Nico on the shoulder. Hey, it's cool, just, just follow the team. Stay out of Zoe's way, we'll have a blast. Chiron's hoof thundered on the pavilion floor. Heroes, he called. You know the rules, the creek is the boundary line. Blue team, Camp Half-Blood, shall take the West Woods. Hunters of Artemis, Red team, shall take the East Woods. I will serve as referee and battlefield medic. No intentional maiming, please. All magic items are allowed. To your positions. Sweet, Nico whispered next to me. What kind of magic items? Do I get one? I was about to break it to him that he didn't when Talia said, Brew team, follow me. They cheered and followed. I had to run to catch up and tripped over somebody's shield, so I didn't look much like a co-captain, more like an idiot. We set our flag at the top of Zeus's fist. It's this cluster of boulders in the middle of the West Woods that, if you look at it just the right way, it looks like a huge fist sticking out of the ground. If you look at it from any other side, it looks like a pile of enormous deer droppings. But Chiron wouldn't let us call the place the poop pile, especially after it had been named for Zeus, who doesn't have much of a sense of humor. Anyway, it was a good place to set the flag. The top boulder was 20 feet tall and really hard to climb, so the flag was clearly visible, like the rules said it had to be, and it didn't matter that the guards weren't allowed to stand within 10 yards of it. I set Nico on guard duty with Beckendorf and the Stoll brothers, figuring he'd be safely out of the way. We'll send out a decoy to the left, Talia told the team. Selena, you lead that. Got it. Take Laurel and Jason, they're good runners. Make a wide arc around the hunters, attract as many as I can. I'll take the main raiding party around to the right and catch them by surprise. Everybody nodded. It sounded good, and Talia said it with such confidence you couldn't help but believe it would work. Talia looked at me. Anything else to add, Percy? Uh, yeah. Keep sharp on defense. We've got four guards, two scouts. That's not much of it for a big forest. I'll be roving. Yell if you need help. And don't leave your post! Talia said. Unless you see a golden opportunity, I added. Sco Talia scowled. Just don't leave her post. Right, unless... Percy! She touched my arm and shocked me. I mean, everyone can give static shocks in the winter, but when Talia does it, it hurts. I guess it's because her dad is the god of lightning. She's been known to fry off people's eyebrows. Sorry, Talia said, though she didn't sound particularly sorry. Now, is everybody clear? Everybody nodded. We broke into our smaller groups. The horn sounded, and the game began. Selena's group disappeared into the woods on the left. Talia's group gave it a few seconds, then darted off toward the right. I waited for something to happen. I climbed Zeus's fist and had a good view over the forest. I remembered how the hunters had stormed out of the woods when they fought the manticore, and I was prepared for something like that. One huge charge that could overwhelm us. But nothing happened. I caught a glimpse of Selena and her two scouts. They ran through a clearing, followed by five of the hunters, leading them deep into the woods and away from Talia. The plan seemed to be working. Then I spotted another clump of hunt hunters headed to the right, bows ready. 
They must have spotted Talia. What is happening? Nico demanded, trying to climb up next to me. My mind was racing. Talia would never get through, but the hunters were divided. With that many on either flank, their center had to be wide open. If I moved fast... I looked at Beckendorf. Can you guys hold the fort? Beckendorf snorted. <laughs> of course. I'm going in. The Stoll brothers and Nico cheered as I raced toward the boundary line. I was running at top speed and I felt great. I leaped over the creek into enemy territory. I could see their silver flag up ahead, only one guard who wasn't even looking in my direction. I heard fighting to my left and right, somewhere in the woods. I had it made. The guard turned at the last minute. It was Bianca D'Angelo. Her eyes widened as I slammed into her and she went sprawling in the snow. Sorry, I yelled. I ripped down the silver silk flag from the tree and took off. I was 10 yards away before Bianca managed to yell for help. I thought I was home free. Zip! A silvery cord raced across my ankles and fastened to the tree next to me. A tripwire fired from a bow. Before I could even think about stopping, I went down hard, sprawling in the snow. Patsy! Talia yelled off to my left. What are you doing? Before she reached me, an arrow exploded at her feet and a cloud of yellow smoke billowed around her team. They started coughing and gagging. I could smell the gas from across the woods. The horrible smell of sulfur. No fair, Talia gasped. Fart arrows are unsportsmanlike. I got up and started running again. Only a few more yards to the creek and I had the game. More arrows whizzed past my ears. A hunter came out of nowhere and slashed at me with her knife, but I parried and kept running. I heard yelling from our side of the creek. Beckendorf and Nico were running toward me. I thought they were coming to welcome me back, but then I saw they were chasing someone. Zoe Nightshade, racing toward me like a cheetah, dodging campers with no trouble. And she had our flag in her hands. No! I yelled, and I poured on the speed. I was two feet from the water when Zoe bolted across to her own side, slamming into me for good measure. The hunters cheered as both sides converged on the creek. Chiron appeared out of the woods looking grim. He had the Stoll brothers on his back, and it looked as if both of them had taken some nasty whacks to the head. Connor Stoll had two arrows sticking out of his helmet like antennae. The Hunters win, Chiron announced without pleasure. Then he muttered, For the 56th time in a row. Patsy S. Jackson! Talia yelled, storming toward me. She smelled like rotten eggs, and she was so mad that blue sparks flickered across her armor. Everybody cringed and backed up because of Aegis. It took all my willpower not to cower. What in the name of the gods were you thinking? She bellowed. I bawled my fists. I'd have enough bad stuff happen to me for one day. I didn't need this. I got the flag, Talia. I shook it in her face. I saw a chance and I took it. I was out there to base, Talia yelled. But the flag was gone. If you hadn't butted in, we would have won. You had too many on you. Oh, so it's my fault. I didn't say that. Ah! Talia pushed me and a shock went through my body that blew me backward ten feet into the water. Some of the campers gasped. A couple of the hunters stifled laughs. Sorry, Talia said, turning pale. I didn't mean to... Anger roared in my ears. A wave erupted from the creek, blasting into Talia's face and dousing her from head to toe. I stood up. Yeah! I growled. I didn't mean to either. Talia was breathing heavily. Enough! Chiron ordered. But Talia had out her spear. You want some seaweed brain? Somehow, it was okay when Annabeth called me that. At least I'd gotten used to it. But hearing it from Talia was not cool. Bring it on, pinecone face! I raised Riptide, but before I could even defend myself, Talia yelled, and a blast of lightning came down from the sky, hit her spear like a lightning rod, and slammed into my chest. I sat down hard. There was a burning smell. I had a feeling it was my clothes. Talia! Chiron said. That is enough! I got to my feet and willed the entire creek to rise. It swirled up, hundreds of gallons of water in a massive icy funnel cloud. Percy! Chiron pleaded. I was about to hurl it at Talia when I noticed something in the woods. I lost my anger on my concentration all at once. The water splashed back into the creek bed. Talia was so surprised she turned to see what I was looking at. Someone, something, was approaching. It was shrouded in a murky green mist, but as it got closer, 
The campers and hunters gasped. This is impossible, Chiron said. I'd never heard him sound so nervous. Eh, she never left the attic, never. And yet, the withered mummy that held the oracle shuffled forward until she stood in the center of the group. Mist curled around our feet, turning the snow a sickly shade of green. None of us dared move. Then her voice hissed inside my head. Apparently everyone could hear it, because several clutched their hands over their ears. I am the spirit of Delphi, the voice said. Speaker of the prophecies of Phoebus Apollo, slayer of the mighty Python. The oracle regarded me with its cold, dead eyes. Then she turned unmistakably toward Zoe Nightshade. Approach, seeker, and ask. Zoe swallowed. What must I do to help my goddess? The oracle's mouth opened and green mist poured out. I saw the vague image of a mountain and a girl standing on it barren peak. It was Artemis, but she was wrapped in chains, fettered to the rocks. She was kneeling, her hands raised as if to fend off an attacker, and it looked like she was in pain. The oracle spoke. Five shall go west to the goddess in chains. One shall be lost in a land without the rain. The bane of Olympus shows the trail. Campers and hunters combined prevail. The titan's curse must one withstand, and one shall perish by a parent's hand. There, as we were watching, the mist swirled and retreated like a great green serpent into the mummy's mouth. The oracle sat down on a rock and became as still as she had been in the attic, as if she might sit by this creek for a hundred years.